Hello and welcome to the uh, October 2021 uh, podcast and videocast of uh, the uh, American Journal of Public Health. This month, we are discussing uh, once again the issue of uh, occupation and, and workplace conditions, since uh, this is uh, really a major aspect of uh, everybody's life. And we always said in the journal, that's a very important component of public health. So since the, uh, the beginning of uh, the pandemic, we've seen that uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic has hurt in particular, you know, essential workers who were at the front line uh, during all the worst months of the pandemic in 2020, having to uh, go to work and respond in different uh, uh, types of occupation in order for the rest of society to be able to continue and, and survive. So uh, what's the situation today after uh, those uh, worst months and as we're heading towards probably the, the end of this pandemic? Uh, some employers say they can't find workers. Uh, is this uh, because uh, there, there have been uh, too many casualties among essential workers or are workers able to negotiate better or choose better where they want to work? And uh, we have uh, uh, prepared this, uh, this uh, podcast uh, on, uh, uh, you know, discussing an article that we published in the uh, October issue of the journal prepared by uh, Lisa Berkman uh, at Harvard on workplace redesign for the 21st century. And we've invited people that are major actor in not only the conception of the redesign, but its actual implementation. So let me first uh, ask my uh, interviewees to introduce themselves. The reason is that for those of you who are only listening to the podcast, you will be able to connect their voice and uh, uh, who they are. So let me start with uh, Marcy. Marcy, uh, please introduce yourself. Hi, yes, I'm Marcy Goldstein-Gelb, and I'm co-executive director of the National Council for Occupational Safety and Health, National Kosh. Thank you. Ashley, please introduce Hi. yourself. Hi, my name is Ashley, and I'm a current Walmart worker of three years, and I am also a worker leader with the organization United for Respect. Thank you, Ashley. Francisco. Hi everyone, my name is Francisco Diaz. I am the worker justice policy advocate at the Center for Popular Democracy. Thank you. And Lisa? I thank you for inviting me and hi to everybody. I'm Lisa Berkman. I'm a socialist epidemiologist and professor at Harvard School of Public Health. And I'm director of the Harvard Center for Population and Development Studies. Thank you. So I'd like to start with you, Ashley. Uh, I'm very eager to know what has been your experience, you know, going through those terrible months of, of 2020 and how do you see the situation today? Uh, can, can you let us know what has been uh, your trajectory for those months? So things were definitely a little bit crazy for a while because We've had problems before the pandemic in terms of cleanliness with our stores. And during the pandemic, it just seemed to escalate the issue because we had associates that were contracting COVID-19, but our store never shut down for any special cleaning. And the level of cleaning that our store was doing was just the same before the pandemic. So we, there hasn't really been any extra cleaning involved even during the pandemic and when workers were contracting COVID-19. So how, you know, how many of your colleagues uh, contracted COVID-19? How was it during those months? Do, do you remember? It, it was very hectic. I know we had at least five cases and in one instance, a whole department was shut down and it was only that department that was shut down. And management, for most of the time, when we had a positive case, didn't notify us when somebody tested positive. And I remember in one instance, my manager had grouped us all in the meeting and said, yes, yeah, some, yes somebody contracted COVID-19, you know, 
be safe, sanitize your hands, sanitize your carts, because I work in online groceries, so we're touching our carts all day and touching totes all day. And I remember in that moment, because she didn't say exactly who it was, that was when I went and got a COVID-19 test because I wanted to be safe and wanted to be sure. And we weren't even encouraged to go get a COVID test. I, none, none of the times that anybody tested positive did management suggest that we go get a COVID-19 test. And so, so what, how is the situation today? How do you and your colleagues react, you know, after having experienced such a situation? During the pandemic, we have been working to fight for better conditions in our stores in terms of the health and safety, the cleanliness. I remember during the pandemic, we had formed a Laurel Committee made up with some workers in our store. We filed an OSHA complaint about some of the conditions in our stores, such as the lack of soap dispensers, the dirty air vents. If you look up at the air vents in our store, some of them are completely black with dust, and there's a possibility of mold up there. And in addition to filing that OSHA complaint, we also made a list of demands of other things in our store that needed to be fixed. And we also got together and sent a letter to our politicians in our state. We're in Maryland. So we contacted Senator Ben Cardin, Senator Chris Van Hollen, and Governor Hogan as well. And Senator Van Hollen contacted Walmart Corporate about the conditions in our store. And we finally started to see results. We got some of our demands met such as the additional soap dispensers they started to replace some of the ceiling tiles in our store and we also got together with united for respect on a national campaign with other walmart workers amazon workers and PetSmart workers to form five to survive with our demands during the pandemic such as paid pandemic leave Uh, protection from retaliation for speaking out about COVID-19 conditions. And we also have a COVID-19 tracker that associates can use to report COVID-19 uh, positive cases. And then also last year, we had the Walmart shareholders meeting. And one of our founders, Cindy Murray, she put in a proposal to have a pandemic advisory council made up entirely of workers to help with our to help with some of our five to survive demands and also to improve the conditions in all Walmart stores overall and it was met with a 29% in favor vote from the shareholders thank you ashley for uh, this uh, testimony and so let me uh, move to lisa now uh, How did you come to this idea that uh, after COVID, uh, we should redesign the workplace? And w what would be the main aspect of this redesign? So we had been thinking about workplace redesign well before COVID. Um, in fact, we think of the workplace as probably the major social determinant of health that is really modifiable and is most often neglected, that we think about education, about neighborhoods, we have a whole set of other institutions, but we rarely think about what can be done at the workplace. Um, COVID kind of, we like to say, brought it into Technicolor. And I think Ashley's story is like amazingly on target because there are two elements when you think about workplace redesign during, um, especially during the pandemic. One was the physical work environment, right? So there were a lot of issues about safety, about worker safety, about testing, about distancing, cleanliness, things that are in OSHA's, um, I would say sweet spot at some place, you know, at some level, not that they maybe pay attention to them, but that they think about the physical environment. What is not often thought about is the organizational and the social environment. And that's what was also put into chaos, right? So that people needed um, time off, they needed much greater schedule control, their families were put at risk. There were a whole set of relational um, factors that had to be re realigned. We talked about, and Ashley, you, actually your examples are fantastic. One is worker voice. Worker voice is terribly important. 
and really neglected. And this move from sort of shareholder to stakeholder voice within companies is really essential. And when we think about workplace organization, we think about the shift that has to be made between managers and workers so that they're together solving problems and having worker voice. And that there's another element of what we traditionally think of as job strain that really is schedule control. But schedule control used to be about the pace that you made widgets, right? Schedule control now is when do you come to work? When do you get to go off? Can your boss make you stay longer? Can your boss tell you to leave earlier and not come in today? Is work precarious? So we see schedule control, worker voice as incredibly essential and came to light during COVID, but they were there all along. It's just that they're supremely shown in their importance right now. And then the physical environment are the new kinds of physical risks that, that OSHA has to get get on top of, but they're aligned with chemical risks and physical hazards. They're not, they're not different for OSHA to think about. They just need to think about them that way. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Francisco, uh, you know, when people say that we are currently in a workers' economy, that is, uh, there is this apparent shortage of workforce and the employers are, have a hard time finding workers, at least in the conditions that they used to have them. And uh, that this may be a good, you know, context, a good situation to actually obtain uh, all the different elements that Ashley and Lisa have uh, uh, described. So what do, what's the situation currently? Uh, is it a worker's economy? I don't think it, I would call it quite a worker's economy just yet, but... Um, Give, especially given the fact that the levels of worker organization in this country and the levels of worker voice and the volume of that voice is still very, very small. And But thanks to workers like Ashley, through organizations like United for Respect and unions that are now currently standing up, we have a certain, we have a better chance now, in part because of the economic conditions you have outlined, Alfredo. Um, I think it's really critical to for workers to press their advantage now while there is a worker shortage. And that worker shortage is often seen as a negative thing on the part of employers, but is actually a positive thing because workers have more ability to choose between workplaces, as well as put pressure on their current employers to say, we need you to step up to improve the workplace, to redesign what how it currently exists but at the same time that's not going to be necessarily enough you know we are here on social media you can find lots of anecdotes of workers who are deciding to step back or quit their jobs because they know they can find another job but those conditions aren't permanent which is part of the reason why it's important to win big campaigns like those that are being led by united for respect whether it's on fair work week on the federal level or by community organizations and labor unions on fair work week laws on the state and local level that have been won in the past that do make a big difference exactly in the way that um, uh, Dr. Berkman has uh, outlined in, this, in the study that she wrote, uh, co-wrote with several co-authors. And I think that's why um, you know, the current circumstances can be useful and very helpful for workers, but we need to use every advantage we have. And I say this also as a unionized worker, to make these moments to push for our um, improvements in our workplaces um, and really try and make those redesigns possible now and even push beyond those to solidify what gains are possible now and um, make them as permanent as possible um, for uh, future workforces. But Francisco, sorry for my ignorance, but why is this? Is there a shortage? I mean, were work decimated by, by the pandemic or... Is the, you know, are there more, uh, you know, position available? To, why, why is this? I do not have the complete answer. I'm not uh, an expert on the worker shortage. I think it's been a mystery and have been a hotly debated issue in kind of public affairs circles and in the media and in the press. But I definitely think that there has been a, a sort of kind of economic whiplash on both the supply and the demand side. Where on the demand side, you saw kind of infusions of cash coming from various public um, services and public programs to try and push back the pandemic, the reset, the pandemic induced recession. At the same time, you're seeing kind of supply shortages um, that are also leading to kind of ch massive changes as, you know, 
as companies and various um, firms try and respond to the increase in demand from this infusion of cash. Um, I don't think that's the only one that's currently kind of the cause of that worker shortage, but I think it is regardless of kind of its cause. And I think one of the things I will outline that is not its cause is unemployment insurance. Pandemic unemployment has expired at this point. Um, but even then, I would say that it's actually a good thing that if pandemic unemployment is creating an outside exit option for workers, that's actually something that empowers them at the end of the day, and actually doesn't seem to have a significant effect on the employment level. And if anything, it was helping increase employment over time, because you saw more cash going in, that meant more jobs, that meant um, more need to hire, to expand production, to expand consumption. Marcy, uh, my question to you is, you know, there are strikes all over the country in, in different companies. What's the situation? Are we seeing a real national movement that may actually transform the situation or are these only local uh, phenomena? Yeah, you know, um, some of the themes that Ashley and Lisa and Francisco have been, have been building on, I, I just want to build on those related to your question. And that is that, you know, we came from a starting place where there was such a disparity of power between employers and employees, where workers could be disposed of so easily, you know, unless you have a collective bargaining uh, agreement, unless you're in a union, then you cannot sit down at the table and you could be fired without reason. Speaking up is puts you at grave risk. If you can't pay for food on your table, you have to turn to temp work, to gig work. So that you know disparity makes it possible for employers to ignore health and safety con working conditions of all sorts. Uh, speed, uh, you know, Lisa mentioned there's any control of your schedule, uh, including, you know, the pace of work, including when it is, not to mention the more traditional dangers. And the public, you know, what we saw historically was people were dying and getting sick and getting ill. And when it was in the press, they would call it a freak accident, even though there's a pattern in a history of workers over and over again, dying and getting sick on the job. And the public would read it And it would be extremely disturbing. Oh, my God, what a horrible thing. This person died. Now I need to move on to page two. And that's if it made it to the press at all. And so all of a sudden in the pandemic, the word essential came up. And something that we all knew at this table was true, that workers have always been essential. Finally, it was recognized that we need workers. We can't eat. We can't be taken care of without workers, we can't get our stuff. <laughs> and so that gave some leverage, you know, again, in the beginning where workers were needed and recognized. And over time, you know, again, workers have always been taking collective action either through union or not through union, through worker centers and cost groups. But this pandemic provided yet another opportunity for workers to assert their voices because they had some leverage Um, it's not enough, as Francisco said, it's not permanent. Uh, and so there needs to be more institutionalized power for workers, a voice at the table, as Lisa and Ashley have mentioned, that they, if they're going to be essential, then they need to have an essential voice at every table, at the workplace and, and at political spheres, and they need to have essential protections. And that's something that They've had to fight for tooth and nail. They've not been provided those protections by our federal government. That's a whole topic we can we can cover. Even to, to now, uh, they have not had protections. So it's taken that enormous courage to just come together with your coworkers and take that action. And it is happening all over the country. Let me also insist on, you know, I'd like to know the depth of the, of the movement. So am I doing too much of, for example, what I see as a symbol that, you know, John Deere workers, they are in Kansas. I mean, Kansas, that's a red state. I mean, a very solidly red state. So how, if workers in Kansas can start to strike, what does it mean for other places, you know, like, like California and other, and, and blue states? I mean, Yeah, you know, and, and I think Striketober is, is sort of an, an understatement. Uh, it's really been, you know, sort of actions throughout the pandemic. And again, it didn't start in, you know, 2020. The, um, you know, workers coming together collectively and working with, you know, in non-unionized settings with worker centers, cash groups, and in union settings, 
you know, many unions recognizing the power of organizing. It's been in the in the works. And, it, you know, there's sort of a, as as people see that they're making a difference by their actions, they inspire others to take action. And that's what worker leadership is about. And, you know, Ashley, as an example, as a worker leader connected to many other worker leaders, it, it, it really is a movement. And, you know, one of the things that we try to do at National Kosh is to bring together worker leaders and their allies from across the country to learn from each other, to say, here are, here's what's working. Here's how you can build that power, both, you know, in the streets as well as institutionally. And you need that, you know, you literally need that solidarity in order to make it sustained in the long run. Yeah. So I invite everybody to, to, to chime in, you know, uh, for having a discussion. Uh, Ashley, uh, you know, I had interviewed union leaders in, in 2019, 2018. They were depressed. I have to say they, they were saying, you know, the union members were declining. Unions were becoming thinner and thinner. I mean, we've associated lack of unions with what has been called the death of despairs in middle-aged white men, mostly but women also in the Appalachian, etc. Do you feel a change in the situation? Do you think that there is a dynamic that is grooving? Yeah, I am starting to see increased uh, interest in wanting to join uh, unions and United for Respect because I'm a part of a couple Facebook groups like the United for Respect Walmart group. And then also we, there's a whole group called the Walmart Associates, and we're starting to see more people wanting change and more people being interested in organizations like United for Respect and also in unions as well. So I think the dynamic is definitely changing for more worker unions and for more organizations to be able to help with conditions in the stores and fight for better pay. It's it's a great shift that I'm starting to see. And, and Lisa, from from your perspective, uh, you know, as a scholar, do you feel a difference? I mean, you've been working on this for so many. Do you feel a difference in the new situation? Yeah, yeah. I think that this has been um, like the least love sister of uh, social determinants um, and unrecognized. You know, it's kind of OK, there's work. But there's also this and this and this, all of which are really important. I don't want to say they aren't important. To me, the pressing question now is how does change come about? And listening to everybody and thinking about it a little bit, I think, well, change comes about when workers themselves organize and rise. And you've talked about this and their voice becomes predominant enough that, that workplaces are pressured into change. Um, the second one, obviously, is regulation, is that we do pass more um, regulations in the way that we did for toxic um, or physical or ergonomic exposures, that kind of thing. And the third one, which to me is, is kind of interesting and challenging, is will workplaces, will companies change? And will companies see, to some extent, that worker well-being is at the core of productivity? Like, is it really an expense or is it a positive? And I feel like maybe I'm somewhat naive here, but I do think there are a lot of times where worker well-being should be synchronous with productivity. It should make better productivity. And I think some of the work on the gap and schedule control shows that when workers, when you care about workers, when their well-being is taken into consideration, turnover is less, productivity is more. And somebody once said, it's, it's that companies like have the math wrong. Like they don't take into account the long run kind of success that productivity that they would reap if they truly in, invested in worker well-being. I think traditionally there, there always been some companies that uh, reacted better than others and understand yes. that and others that are really right. on Hybrid their, companies, we talk yeah. about good jobs. Yeah, so, so, so they and the other thing I want to stress, because that's the whole discussion today about human uh, uh, rights and, and public health. I mean, there's no public health without regulation and regulation is enforced. So that's the aim we need to have regulation, those rules and enforcing them in order to have public health. 
And that's, that should, should be the goal. But let's close on, you know, I'd like to have your opinion on, you know, the, the question that Lisa raised, how shall we implement it? And I'm going to ask you to give me what you think is the most important condition, starting with Francisco. What's the most important condition to succeed? Oh, I honestly think that it's going to take, sometimes it's going to take workers' voices and workers' power to get companies to realize that the long-term investment is actually worthwhile. Um, just kind of speaking to Lisa's side. And uh, if I can get another thing in, finding robust enforcement mechanisms, especially for low-wage and part-time workers who really need it. Thank you. So, Marcy, what's the um, thing? Yeah, I mean, it, it, obviously, worker voices are at the core. Um, but in order for worker voices to not be at grave risk as they've always been, everybody everybody deserves a collective bargaining agreement. Everybody should be able to sit at the table with employers uh, at an equal footing. Thank you. And Ashley, I'm going to give you the last word because probably you're the one who has the best answer to this question. What's for you most important in the months and years to come to succeed in this negotiation? Definitely raising worker voices, having workers at the table, and then also passing legislation like the PRO Act, which will help protect workers from retaliation from their employers when they choose to do an action or to speak out about some of the things going on in the store, which some, there's a, I, I come across a lot of workers that want to speak out, but they're too afraid to speak out because they're afraid of losing their job or they're going to get retaliated in some other um, form or fashion. And because we actually did a Facebook Live, and after we did the Facebook Live, people are like, what if they fire you? Or what if they, you know, switch you to another department? What if they coach you? Which coaching in Walmart world is a, um, is a write-up. And people saw that because I had the protection of the organization, nothing happened to me. They were too afraid to retaliate against me. So, and if they did fire me, they would have a whole organization coming to attack them over it. Thank you, thank you, Ashley. I have to thank you all for, for your time, for, for your intervention. I, I, you know, my feeling is that there is so much, you know, optimism, energy, courage in this uh, podcast, you know, that you, you've just, you know, made my day. It's fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I hope I'll meet you in person soon. Uh, okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.